thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Uh, it reminds me how long I've been on this earth. Um, it also shows that you don't have to pick one career and stick with it all the time. Although I've been with the foreign ministry almost 30 years now and happy to do that until I retire. Um, it, it's great to be in this room. Thank you, Professor Martin Holland. So that's a very good last name. Uh, that's probably why I, I was invited in the first place. Uh, the European flag, uh, the posters, which are really beautifully done. Uh, I don't know whether some of the artists and students who made them are here, but congratulations. I think we'll return to that subject afterwards. And uh, the map of Europe as well. Um, uh, I had some difficulty finding my own country because you've got all the uh, graduates who are there uh, in, in Europe uh, indicated by stickers. And um, my country is geographically speaking so small that it disappears uh, underneath the sticker. It's about one seventh the size of New Zealand and we've got four times the people. So imagine how busy it is on the streets. Um, Auckland traffic jams are nothing compared to what you find in my country. Um, that's Europe, which is far away. Um, nevertheless, New Zealand and the Netherlands have lots of things in common. But geographically, we are far apart. And that does make a huge difference for the way we look at the world. We've got far-reaching consequences for the way we define our interests and where our in interests lie. Let me just, this is our logo, EU presidency logo, which is the same as last time. We thought we wouldn't spend money on an expensive design bureau and just change the year. Um, this is the UN. And this has to do with our perception of the world. We should be members of, Euro of international organizations. We should be members of the European of the United Nations because it's a worldwide organization and like New Zealand we'd like to contribute to a, an orderly world and to help countries and peoples in need but you are members of the European Union because that's our region. Let's have a look at where we are. Now this is you on top of the world <laughs> uh, far away from us and this is us and because we're so small I put a circle around it and you can see different neighborhoods and that makes quite a difference. For you, China and Australia are very near. For us, it is the European Union, it is Russia, it's North Africa, it is the Middle East. Distances in our part of the world are much smaller. Once again, the Netherlands in Europe and in blue, the UK still included. You see the member states of the European Union. Uh, this is going to be a challenge and we'll come back to that later on. Switzerland is in the middle grey. I'm fascinating to hear that the Swiss ambassador, who is a very good colleague of mine, uh, is also invited. I think it's very good to have his perspective on the European Union. Because very often now in the debate about UK in or out of the EU, Switzerland is presented as a possible model to follow. Well, I think my Swiss colleague will explain to you how close the ties are between Switzerland and the European Union and how many things that are decided upon determined by the European Union actually have to be adopted by the Swiss and by the Norwegians. So just leaving and thinking you can be like Switzerland doesn't really answer all the British uh, Brexiteers are posing right now. So here we are, we are the presidency of the European Union and but I was actually looking for our neighborhood and here we are. Just a bit more expanded the map of Europe and you see where Russia is, where Turkey, Iraq, Syria are, where North Africa is. And just to imagine the, the distances, I've got here your neighborhood and we project the European Union. So that's quite small, isn't it? From Amsterdam to Moscow by airplane, four hours, which takes you to the east of Australia. Damascus, the capital of Syria, is a bit further away than Brisbane is from Christchurch. So this is a very compact neighborhood. It means that all the things that happen in our neighborhood are very close to us. There are land bridges everywhere. The Mediterranean is much more narrow than the Trans-Tasman uh, Ditch. Uh, there is no way we can avoid all those problems. And these are turbulent times for us right now. 
I think I should, I could, in an almost Chinese way, sum them up as three R's and a T. Refugees, Russia, referendum, and terrorism, that's the T. And at the same time, I could say three C's, confidence, cohesion, citizens. And that has to do with the internal workings of the European Union. <coughs> Let me point out two external challenges that we are faced with right now. One, of course, is the conflict in Syria, um, which is a conflict caused, first of all, by the regime of President Assad because he's been waging war on his own people for five years now. And secondly, of course, the terrorist organization Islamic State, or Daesh, as it is all, also called. The combined influence of those violent actions, agents of violent action, leads to a flow of refugees from Syria First of all, to the neighboring countries, Turkey, I think, hosts to almost 4 million, if not more, refugees, Lebanon, Jordan as well, and then on to Europe, causing, first of all, a huge problem for the states where they are entering the European Union, Greece in the first place, but also pressure on the European Union as a whole. A second uh, effect of that conflict in the Middle East it's not entirely caused by that conflict, but it does play into it, is radicalization among young Muslims in Europe itself. I only have to refer to the attacks twice, actually, in Paris and in Brussels, and you know what I'm talking about. The unfortunate element there is, while radicalization influences from outside play a role, and while returning fighters, jihadists, play a role as well, there's also a homegrown issue there of alienation. So internal factors and external factors combine to pose us with a real challenge, one of integration, our Muslim friends, compatriots, or a small group of them, of them <coughs> feel alienated, but also the siren song, if you will, of radicalization coming from that part of the Middle East where we have the Syrian and Iraq conflicts. My country is affected by it too. We estimate that about 200 young Muslims from our countries, passport holders, have gone to Syria. We assess about 40 have been killed, 40 have returned. We do keep close tabs on them. Hopefully we will be able, also through our developing contact with leaders of the Muslim community, communities I should say, themselves, to prevent radicalization and to present credible and attractive alternatives to the way of violent radicalization. But it is a deep concern to us um, that things may not be totally um, under control. So there you see another reason why what's happening in Syria and Iraq is of direct concern to us. We do cooperate within the European Union when it comes to anti-terrorism measures. We've had a broad consensus within the European Council. It it, the measure, measures include better information sharing between intelligence services, using combining databases, tracing and cutting off the financing that enables terrorist acts. But that's just internal. We also have to address the root causes in the Middle East itself, and that means engaging with governments as far as that's possible and see what we can do to improve situations in those countries. For Syria it means in the first place uh, having a package in place to, <clears throat> to help the refugees and to help the host countries there. <clears throat> 